Killing each other over this book, over that book, over this part of it, what Jesus did say or what Jesus did not say. Jesus was God. Jesus was not God. He was born of a virgin. No, he wasn't. I mean, it was a lot of bloodlet over all of those questions. And so he said, if I'm going to uh, once they realized they couldn't wipe the Christians out, that they had to co-opt it and make it a national religion, an institution, and use it for the advancement of the empire, then Emperor Constantine said, in order to be able to do that, it's got to be organized. In order for it to be organized, you have to have an agreed upon system of beliefs. And that's when they called the Council of Nicaea with the 310 bishops to decide what they were going to believe and what they were not going to believe was also decided what was going to be in the New Testament and what was not going to be in the New Testament. And that's when, okay, let me just finish this point. There was a man who went in as a deacon to the Council of Nicaea. His name was Athanasius. He came out a bishop. Why? Because he was one of the few Europeans there who could read and write. The Africans who went there, and there were many Africans, the African church was a leading church. The Africans who went to that council of Nicaea said, no, Jesus Christ was not one and the same with God. He was a son of God in the sense that he was a great prophet. And most of them was disagreed that he was born of a woman without having had an intimate relationship with a man because the word virgin meant something different to them. You know, it made something altogether different. So the Africans went in with, no, he was not God. He was a great prophet. What you hear in Islam now. And he was, only Islam says he was born of a virgin. That means a woman never had a man. And that's not true. The African didn't believe that because it wasn't necessary for the African to believe that their son of God or any of their deities was born without the natural process because they were in harmony with that natural process. So there was no problem. Europeans had a problem with the uh, as Dr. Wilson explains very well in the ISIS papers, Europeans have a problem with the procreation process. But I can't go into that now. So they went in with that idea. The Europeans who dominated the council said this, Jesus was born of a woman without the aid of a man. Um, they also said that uh, he is one and the same with God. Uh, and that's when they threw the Africans out who disagreed. Among them was Arius. They threw them out and hunted them down till they drove them up in the hills. And it was at that time they decided that they would use the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they could edit those and make them fit the ideas they wanted to project about the Christian belief at that time. The others, they could not do that too, because the others spoke about Jesus' wife, spoke about two of his wives that he had, the others spoke about his children. These other gospels, so they had to leave them out. They can only deal with the ones that, and still I can go in the Gospel of John and show you that Jesus was married, but that's another question we'll deal with there. Now, let me, let me finish this point. They then, after Nathias went back and came up with 27 books for the New Testament, 13 of the letters of the Apostle Paul, the four Gospels and the others. And that's when, that's when Constantine said, that's the New Testament? He said, yes. He said, I have the sword to back it up. And that's how it got that way. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, what's the difference between and what I'm Throughout history, ecclesia um, is the word church. All it meant was where a group of people gathered to discuss political issues. It was a political institution at first. Jesus did not found a new religion. He was not interested in founding a new religion any more than Buddha was interested in founding a new religion. He was interested, he was a Hebrew, he practiced the Hebrew religion and culture. 
He was an African who practiced the Hebrew religion and culture, and he said, I came not to destroy the law of the prophets, but to fulfill it in my life. He didn't come to give anything new. He didn't tell them anything new. Everything he said, you can find that they say he said in the New Testament, you can find the Old Testament. So there was nothing new he said. He didn't find a new one. It's the people who found a religion after he died, as they always do when great people die. So, 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 so when he said, I would build my church, let me make this clear. He had come up with a political organization that was called the Nazarene Party. Y'all got me way off the subject now. I got to get back on it. But hold on, I'm going to finish this one, though. The Nazarene Party. Read the book, The Jesus Party, by Hugh J. Schoenfield. And also, The Incredible Christians, by Hugh J. Schoenfield. Dr. Schoenfield, the uh, uh, so-called Christian Jew. And also, uh, The uh, Passover Plot. Those three books, and you'll get a lot of insight. I'm working on this book that I hope to be finished one day before I leave here. Lord, Lord, give me help. Black Historical Facts on the Life of Jesus. I've been working on it for years. Uh, uh, same one, Hugh J. Schoenfield. Passover Plot, The Incredible Christians, and The Jesus Party. They will really give you insight on this. This word, Ecclesia, Ecclesia and in my book, uh, God, the Bible, and the Black Man's Destiny, I break that down. It meant a place of gathering. It was a place of assembly, a place of political gathering, because the Nazarene party was interested in the liberation of the Israelites at that time from the Roman uh, oppression in their own land. So they were fighting for liberation. And they had come about as a black united front. Jesus was endeavoring to bring under the Nazarene party the Sadducee party, the Zealot uh, party, the uh, Pharisee party, and the Essenes party. All those parties, all these factions, just like you got with black folk today, all these factions were going on, and Jesus was trying to organize them. That's why if you look among his 12 disciples, you'll see that all, each one of them belonged to those different parties. So he was trying to pull all of those together. The Zealot party was the one that he had. Jesus and the Zealots is another book you want to read, Zealots. Jesus and the Zealots by uh, S. G. F. Brandon. Brandon, okay. He's um, a theologian at Manchester University. At, in Jesus of, and the Zealots, in the very first chapter, the very first paragraph, this is what is written. The only thing known about Jesus of Nazareth for certain is that he was crucified as a rebel against the Roman Empire. Everything else is a matter of belief. The only thing, and the other thing is we happen to know he was a black man. That we can prove. But he was crucified as a, not for starting a new religion. Rome couldn't have given less than a thing of damn about a new religion. They always had new religions popping up in Rome. So you see these things in, in Quo Vadis and uh, in, in, in uh, the robe and the Christians teaching love and the, the threat to the emperor. The emperor would have appreciated that because they were taught to love the emperor. Love your enemy, if that's what Christianity was really about. But it wasn't. It was a threat to the Roman Empire. And the only way it could be a threat to the Roman Empire is that it's threatened to do what? Throw the Roman Empire. Or if it threatened to liberate those who were being oppressed by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire today, America, the same Roman Eagle, the same Roman Senate, doesn't have any problem when we walk around teaching love. Love you one another, love everybody. They killed Dr. King for teaching love. They killed Dr. King because he said, what, we have to stand up and fight for our own. Even though the method he used was ridiculous, nonviolent resistance, yet it was resistance. It was a revolutionary act. It was questioning the authority of America to do what it did. So that's what Jesus was killed for. They killed him as the king of the Jews. They didn't kill him as the savior of the world. They didn't kill him for starting a new religion. They killed, and what was the question that Pilate asked him? He asked him a darn thing about you're going to start a new religion. What do you believe? What book do you teach from? Are you, do you read the Bible? He didn't ask him none of that. But he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? That's what he asked him. That was his concern. Are you a political leader? That's what a king is. 
And that's what he was killed for. And the party, the Nazareth, it was all political. It was later that it was changed over and became, so it has always been a political institution because when the Romans took it from the Africans, it was a political institution when the Africans had it because Africans no, did not separate religion and politics. They were one and the same. What did Dr. Williams just tell us? Our religion, what, motivated us to the dynamics that we had to do things on a great scale. So you can't separate your religion from your politics. You hear people say that. Well, no, I don't want to talk about politics. I'm just going to talk about God. How are you going to do that? You can't. Because politics means what? People-related activities. That which affects people. And how are you going to talk about God if you don't talk about what relates to people? And I like the way the Jerusalem Slim, that's what we used to call Jesus in the seminary, you say it. How are you going to love God whom you have not seen and you don't even love your brother and sister that you do know? So the first understanding that you come to know God is to know what? Other human beings. So you can't separate politics from religion. Okay. I would like to, to, to know certain scriptures that you said you can prove that Jesus had why? Oh, no, I certainly will. The next question and answer, maybe we can get to it. Let's get back to the class now. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going on to, we, we answered the question in the last session, who wrote the Bible, and we got a good answer, I think a pretty good answer. We're going to start this session with the question, what is the Bible? Okay, that, that's, the, that's what we, we want to find out here now. What is it? Document three, the book containing the collection of sacred writings accepted, what? Accepted. By Christians as inspired of God and as possessing divine authority. The English word Bible is a transliteration through the Latin and Old French of the Greek Biblia, literally, what? All right, now, we're gonna start and work backwards, okay? On that, we're on document three now. When we're starting, we're gonna work backwards. We start with this word, the Greek word, Biblia. From, which is one of the words we get, the, to modern English Bible, okay? Now, what does the word Biblia mean when you look at that document, from what we read in that document? What does it mean? Little books. So we're not talking about one book, we're talking about many books. All right, that's the, go ahead now, we're getting it. <laughs> yeah, but in this particular thing, little books is what we're talking about. Not one, but little books. Little books. Okay, a collection of little books. It's a collection, it's a mini library, so to speak, okay. The other thing is, we noticed in there, it said it was considered by Christian and Jews to be sacred. Not that it's necessarily sacred, but it's considered. Now, because it's accepted as being sacred by Christian and Jews does not necessarily mean that it has to be what? Sacred to anybody else. We're dealing with document three there, and we're dissecting it. Let me deal with this word sacred a minute, all right? The word sacred, sacred, from the Latin, meaning to, it's a Latin word, we're covering several different languages in here today, meaning to set aside. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that the sky's gonna open, a light's gonna come out, you're gonna hear angel voices. It means set aside, separated from everything else. It's considered better than everything or separated from everything. It has a special place, all right, it's sacred, okay. The word holy, as used in the Bible, is another way in the English language, and it comes from the Old English, halag, meaning whole. Halag? Yeah, halag, meaning whole. Right. Yeah, W-H-O-L. 
meaning whole. yeah total yeah. total or whole right yeah whole English yeah OE I usually put OE for that this is OE this is Latin all right now let's deal with that for a minute all peoples on earth that have a literature and Africans had a literature as we've just discussed thousands upon thousands of years before anyone else had have certain books usually that contains their history the founding of their nation and the rituals by which they practice their religious expression of their spirituality and those books are considered to be are set apart from all other books, books on mathematics, books on chemistry, and, all, and are considered to be sacred or holy. Because the word whole here implies that all of the science that they're carrying on, as Dr. Williams told us, that all that they accomplished in those great civilizations in Kemen and Kush was inspired by their what? Their religion, their sense of their relationship to the divine intelligence in the universe. That's what it was inspired by. So what made them whole was what? Their sense of their connection with that. So it's whole, it's holy, it's sacred because it is embodies or records for us our basic philosophy of life. Right, which gives you your purpose and direction from which you do everything else. Any people have that. Even if they don't have a written, tradition. They have a verbal tradition or they have a ritualistic tradition of some type which demonstrates what the sum total of their philosophy of life is, which is what everything else in their society is predicated upon, right? So wherever you go, whatever system of writings, usually it's connected with their history because history is very important to a people's sense of what their purpose their basic philosophy of life is, the laws and the, 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 the culture and so forth passed on from the elders through the society down through the ages, right? Everywhere you go, you will find people have a system of belief that is embodied in a book or in artwork, artifact, or something. So now, when I come to your land, I'm a stranger, I have with me something that embodies my system of belief, predicated on my world, outlook, and culture, that my purpose for being. I come to you, you have a different book predicated upon your worldview and outlook. Usually when we go into those books, we're gonna find the same basic principles, however they're gonna be expressed, what? Differently because of the uniqueness of our historical experience, right? Now, who's right and who's wrong? <laughs> they're not right or they're wrong, they're just in control. But her point is, even though it's sarcastic, the way she presented it is a sarcastic is good because it illustrates what happened. It illustrates what happened. Whoever has the power to say who's right and who's wrong. Even though we know that's because you have the power, doesn't make it right or wrong. The basic principles of the universe, the basic principles of the universe remain the same no matter what people who are in power say. So, and if they want to stay in power, they should get in harmony with those principles. If they don't, then their power will not serve humanity, but it will destroy humanity. And we've seen so many examples of that in history, especially the one who has demonstrated more than any other people. And I have to emphasize that here too because I'm getting so sick and tired of these white folk telling me, look, you can't hold this against us after all. You all killed each other. You all enslaved each other. Uh, humanity just mistreats humanity. I said, this is true. In our history, we have done this. All people have done this. However, you are the only people on earth that took a people's soul, took their total humanity, and took away from them their collective memory and have kept them away from that collective memory and will assault them violently every time they seek to reawaken that collective memory. No other people have ever done that. Africans have sold out, I got to admit that. 
They sold their war captives and all that. Nevertheless, I don't appreciate, I don't uh, condone slavery of any kind. It's completely opposed to the laws of the universe. And when Africans did that, that meant that African was not practicing his religion because his religion wouldn't have let him do that. He was practicing his greed is what he was doing. He was practicing the lower elements of his human nature, not the higher elements which your religion brings out. Because those Africans that practiced their religion would not, did not commit those atrocities against other Africans. However, even in that, it was not the objective to take away the person's humanity, to strip them of their humanity. They became servants, they were lower on the, on the um, social ladder, but they were never dehumanized. The first people to be humanized was those people. And that's the great difference. So all this thing about, and yes, uh, Native American tribes, they made war on each other, and some of them cut the hamstring of their slaves to keep them from one another away. All those atrocities are awful. They're terrible. I deplore them from any time to anybody. However, they do not alleviate the guilt of the Caucasian who took this to the worst extreme that anyone has ever. So I don't want to hear that. Don't even talk to me about what I did to myself. It's a family matter. That's me to fight over with other Africans, and I do fight the issue. And it's me and other Native Americans. We do fight the issue. But when you and I are talking, you ain't got a damn thing to do with that. That's family. This between me and you. This is between enemies. Because when you did this, you declared yourself as an eternal enemy to the, and the fact that you won't make amends for it properly without a past lip service shows that you're still an enemy. And every time I try to build up my own and get my own, you attack that. You got to be my enemy. Only an enemy act like a friend doesn't act that way. That's right. A friend does not do that to you. Every time black people try to, now whether you're in agreement with the nation of Islam or not, let's, let's not deal with that. When they built those farms up down there in the south, they weren't bothering white people. They didn't bother anybody. And to look at this, this was no threat to white people. The only reason why it was a threat to them is because in their mind, if black people can become self-sufficient, supply their own food, grow their own food, and, and their economy becomes their economy, we don't have any more black folks to exploit. So therefore, it is a threat to us. So they attacked them, and they poisoned the cattle. They did when the Republic of New Africa, the provincial government of the Republic of New Africa went down there and said, we just want to separate from y'all. We don't want to march for freedom no more. We don't want none. We, we're tired. We're exhausted. We just want to have some land we can call our own, build for ourselves. You, you know you owe us this land. There's 40 acres in this mule and all that. Just let us have that. We won't bother you. You don't bother us. They couldn't do that. They had to attack them. They had to lock up their leaders. They had to do all that. Now, that's got to be an enemy. Now, as Malcolm said, let me, let me, let me just say that and state in this from the moral issue. Malcolm said, and many folks don't want you to come here and listen to us because they're afraid we'll teach you to hate the white man. He said, if what he has done to you all this time, and you know he's done, you don't hate him. Certainly nothing here we could say today can make you hate him. So well, on that moral issue, that's not it. So Christians and Jews uh, consider these books to be sacred. But it don't necessarily have to be. And they didn't have the right to go to other people in the world. And, and one of the first things they did, uh, while I'm on this, one of the first things, I'm writing about this now because I'm doing this piece on Columbus, I plan to have finished this year. One of the first things they did when they came to this land was they burned up all the books that the uh, Native Americans had. And I mean, they had some books and values. I mean, they had some knowledge here. They burned up the books here. Yeah, the higher, well, when, yeah, when, and when they, the people here had been trading with and sharing knowledge from the universities here and the universities in Africa for thousands of years before there was a Columbus. But that's another subject. I mean, that's, this had been going, we've been running up and, we were running up and down just like you take the subway over to, to, uh, to Manhattan. We've been traveling all over the world, so it was no big deal. It's only till Columbus come and become a big deal. And it was lost, but on state he found it, it becomes a big deal. But it wasn't, we've been running up and down, as Van Sertum and others point out, we've been running up and down on the Atlantic, as the Ethiopian Ocean, as it was called it, for, 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 for centuries. Now, I don't want to get off into that subject, so hold that, please. Let me get back, back to this. When they came here, they burned the books. The first thing they did when they 
drove the last Moors out of Spain in 1492 and Granada was burned to books. The Christians have a penchant for burning books, but not only Christians, the Muslims, when they first started out to conquer the world on their jihads, except Islam or die, kept burning books until they got to, to uh, 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 Kemet, what they call Egypt now, and they said, ho, 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 ho. If we're going to advance, we're going to have to keep this. So when you look at all of this around us, these pyramids, all these temples and things, we're going to have to add the knowledge they had to do this. So we can't burn this. But when they started out, they started burning. If it wasn't the Quran, it didn't, it didn't mean anything. It didn't have any value. So these stupid, backward European Christians, if it wasn't the Bible, it didn't mean anything. And by the way, by the way, for your information, at the time that they were doing this in 1492 and all those other period, the common people could not read the Bible on pain of death. Only the aristocracy could read it. And of the aristocracy at that time in Europe, hardly 10 kings could read or write. So it had to be read to them by the priests of the Catholic Church and only few of them could read it. I doubt if five or five of them could read it all only parts. That's how the Catholic Church had such a firm hold in Europe at that time. I want you to get the picture there. So now, they considered it to be sacred, so when they got over here and they went to Africa and every place else, they burn up everybody else's sacred book. So that's why, out of all of the sacred books that were in existence, this is the one everybody knows about the most. Because they was busy burning up other people. We're just rediscovering the other material. So that's why this is only a gateway, and I, I can't overemphasize it. This is only a gateway to get back to that knowledge. This is not it. This is a way to get back to it. So this is a small, this is just a, this is a drop in the bucket. The Europeans were the ones who made that book, but in actuality, according to history, there were lots of other books that was included into all of that, but they just chopped it down through the Council of the Sea and gave us that. Right, that's right. We, we created the book, the, the Bible, as, the yeah, the history and the Bible, all those stories and everything that was created they out of African history and culture. What they did was co-opted it, and I'm going to tell you the year they did that as we go on. It's the year 270, but we'll get to that as we go on. Uh, if I forget it, you bring it up in a question and answer. Please write that down, because I want you to know when they first started to take the, 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 uh, this from the African languages and put it in European languages. And what they did is recast it in the image of white supremacy. What they couldn't understand, they cast aside. What they could reasonably comprehend, they included so that they could have a body of, uh, to uh, found their system of belief for a control mechanism. And now here's another thing I want to make clear to you. Um, the white man did not want the slave to read the Bible. So this statement you hear brothers and sisters say, we had the land, the white man had the Bible, now uh, he has the land and we have the Bible. That may be true, and it is true, because it did switch around. He did take the land, however, he didn't come in with the intent of you reading the Bible. He read it to you and interpreted it for you, because when a slave was caught reading the Bible, a slave was killed in those days, because they didn't want, and especially after Nat Turner and Gabriel Prosser then Marvesi and all those folk who had read the Bible and, and read about the Battle of Jericho and all that kind of stuff, and that they, they, they fought for their freedom and liberation, uh, they led slave revolts, so they did not want you to read or have it. So, uh, because whenever you read it from the context of the, as uh, Reverend Jeremoji says, from the context of the black experience, you're going to come out with something altogether different. Even in black churches today, in their, in their Negro to state, they still have a different system of worship in many ways, and their ideas are vastly different. As Brother Malcolm pointed out so well, he said, here, you're being lynched. The man who's lynching you is calling on Jesus. You're being lynched, you're calling on Jesus. Now, which one of y'all have connection with Jesus? <laughs> who's really getting through? at the time. That's the question. And even during the civil rights movement, these were Christian white folks out here who were opposing Christian black folks from having their rights and the right to vote and everything. So we have a different world view, and that is applied to, to, uh, to those religions. So Christians and Jews consider, we're on document three there in the, uh, uh, as we answer the question, we've already answered the question, who wrote the Bible? As we answer the question, what is the Bible? 
Okay, now, I've dealt, dealt with the definition of the word sacred, and also I want to point, and I point out that I want to give you some examples of other sacred writings. The Kiba Nagask of ancient Ethiopia is uh, considered to be sacred, and it is as sacred to them as the Bible is to the Western world. And the Kiba Nagas is spelled uh, K-E-B-A-R. Uh, let me get my notes here to make sure. Yeah, Kiba. Uh, na, uh, da, da, da. Yeah, there it is. Nagas. Okay. It's sacred to them. The Holy Quran is sacred to the Muslims. Uh, the Vedas, which were originally written by Africans, were taken over and co-opted by the Eurasians and inculcated with class structure and all that, uh, where they put the black folks on the bottom. It's sacred to, uh, were sacred to India. Uh, the Kiba Nagas is sacred to the Ethiopian Coptic Church. Everybody has a body of sacred works that is holy to them. Therefore, this book is no more holy than anybody else's. Books are holy to them. And it is only through arrogance, it is only through the will of controlling other people's minds and controlling other people's bodies and other people's lands and money that, uh, or, and resources that one person will say their book is better than the other. And in order for you to be a human being and to be somebody that is going to be accepted as a human being, you have to accept my book. Okay, now we must learn how to glean the best from them all. All right, we've covered that uh, document. Let's read it one more time. The book containing the collection of sacred, uh, collection was a key word there for us, right? Writings accepted by Christians as inspired of God, as possessing divine authority. The English word Bible is a transliteration through the Latin and Old French of the Greek Biblia, literally, little books. Document three, all right. We're still answering the question, what is the Bible? Document four. The word Bible, which in English as in medieval Latin is treated as a singular noun, is in its original Greek form a what? Plural, which is ta, bed, li. Yeah, we're into, you notice in, in, in this study, we're heavy into ling linguistics here. And that's the key. Dr. Williams said you have to get into the languages of things to understand them and understand their origin. First, we have Biblia, which means little books. But now we have another word introduced here, ta Biblia. And ta Biblia which uh, points out the fact that it is a plural instead of the Bible, it is Bibles or little books. Ta Biblia, the sacred books which correctly express the fact that the sacred writings of what? Of Christendom. Are you with me on, on this uh, uh, document four? Ta Biblia, the sacred books which correctly express the fact that the sacred writings of Christendom are made up from a number of that's the word we want there that's what we want there because we've just dealt with the question of sacred and not sacred independent records why is that important to focus on we are used We are accustomed to thinking of this as being a singular document, unified in philosophy, concept, thought, unadulterated, coming directly from the mind of Almighty God itself, being dictated directly to the scribes by God, either through vision through spoken out of the sky or some <laughs> other such method. Right. However, when you get into a translation, we're not attacking belief now, we're studying the language and the history and the science. Now, I want you to understand that. I'm not attacking Christianity or anybody else's belief. I'm just dealing with this historically. 
The word Biblia, little books, but when you get to the other form, the, the old English, another old English and French word, ta Biblia, it means independent records. Not just little books now. First we find out it's not one book, but many. But it's not just many, they're independent. Not only that, that's a chapter one question. The gospel according to Luke also indicates in the free life of the Records. On existing records, yes, indeed. All right, so we, we have established that, right? That there are a number of independent records. Okay, let's go to document five. We made it through that one fast, didn't we? <laughs> okay, document five. We're still answering the question, what is the Bible? And this is the last document on answering that question. The Bible is not one book, but many. The original form and meaning of the word itself bears this out, biblios. In Greek means book, so-called from biblos, the inner bark of papyrus reeds. Oh, 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 we have something mousy in there. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible is not one book? Oh, inner bar of the papyrus reeds on which early writings were inscribed. The Greek name for papyrus was Biblos, later Bibles later given also to manufactured writing materials, and finally to a papyrus scroll of books. All right, we go back now through this English and old French and old English, Biblia, little books, a collection of independent records, to the Greek Biblos books, but we have to take it now to the Latin papyrus, but you don't stop at the Latin because it is talking about something that was grown, a plant that was grown on the banks of the... Nile River, the Hopi River, which is in our cable land in Kemet, that's right. Therefore, they must have had their word for it, which was Q-A-M-A, -A, Kwama. <laughs> and this opens up a whole nother thing to us. Yeah, now this goes from Old English, uh, uh, old English and Old French, another form of the English, more modern English, to the Greek, to the Latin is papyrus, to the Kemetan, Kwama, the African, Kemetan. But now, here we go. White people couldn't have been the first to write the Bible because they weren't the first to have paper. Right. They were not the first to have, because they say the word papyrus also relates to other what? writing materials and scrolls came to be applied to writing material anything and dealt with writing the word biblos even got, was connected with that they therefore weren't the first to create this how do i know this because the first people to develop paper which was first developed the word paper comes from the latin papyrus which was a word to describe quam the plant which grew on the Nile River, or the Hopi River. The paper that we know in the world was first created in Africa, we don't know how long ago, at least four or 5,000 years ago in Africa, it was created. So you can say that Kwama was a plant that was on the Nile River. It, that's exactly right. And they used, that's what they made paper out of and still make it out of there today. Still today, it is made from that there in that land. And that is what the first scrolls were written on because in those days, books were written in scroll fashion and they were rolled up and they were stored in the libraries like that and they pulled out these big scrolls. So they wrote not only the hieroglyphic, the sacred writing, but the uh, demotic type writing as they call the script type writing. They had that as well. They had about four different scripts in ancient Kemet. Not that you keep hearing about the hieroglyphics, but they had all different types of writing there, which they got from Cush, because the Cushites were writing before anybody else. And everybody in Cush could read and write. 
When he got to Kemet, after a while, it was just the priest who could do it. But all of the common people could. But we'll deal with that when we get to the study on Cush uh, later on. Now, here's the kicker. For at least over 3,000 years, Africans dominated the paper industry because nobody else was making paper. Africans dominated the pen and ink industry because nobody else was making pens and ink. In Mesopotamia, they were doing writing, which was called cuneiform writing, but it was etched into a clay tablet, and that clay tablet was baked and was very difficult. Once you came to paper, you could do like you're doing now. You know what I always think? Whenever I see a white man pick up a piece of paper, because this whole country is operated off paper, the whole business could not exist without what? Paper. Even in the modern electronic technology with the computers and the faxes, you still got to have you some paper. The stuff they walk around and say that's so precious is printed on paper with ink. And whenever a white man holds up a piece of paper, I'm always tempted to say to him, did you say all praises do Amon Ra? Amen. All praises do the black man and the black woman because were it not for the black man and the black woman, you couldn't do business today. You certainly couldn't have a banking industry. You wouldn't have any currency if it wasn't for black folks because they were the ones who created Kwama, whom the Latins call papyrus, which is paper upon which all your business is done today. Even... Yes, they had so many methods, so many methods of recording. The, the point I'm trying to raise is the material. And many times we're not aware of that. So when you look at a piece of paper even, and I, I contend that everything just about you look at, you can find the history of your people in it. When you pick up just a piece of paper, a piece of trash off the street, a candy wrapper or something, you are looking at your history. That's something to think about, isn't it? Because it would not exist if it were not for you. Even the trash in the community can tell you something about your history. Now that's something to pass on to our children, isn't it? Pass their history every day. Every time you pass a newsstand, every time you read a comic book, every time you unwrap something, Every time you pick up a pencil, when they go with their notebooks to school, when they go back to school, you know you like that back to school thing, you get all your, your new Lou Leaf book, your new paper, your new pencil, your different color thing. None of this would exist if your ancestors had not on the Hopi River in the Nile Valley years ago created it. There would be no Bible. There wouldn't have been nothing to what? Write it on. There wouldn't be anything. So we dominated that industry. For over 3,000 years, the only people selling paper, or they had to buy it from us now. The Phoenicians were trading it around the world, but to be able to trade, they were the middleman. In order, we were the manufacturers. I like that word. We were the manufacturers of paper. So the only way you could get it was from us. If you were going to sell it anywhere else in the world, you had to come to the African to buy it. No, it was there first. There. Then the art was taken to China and to India. The Chinese will tell you that. The Shang Dynasty was largely responsible for the development of the writing system then. The Shang Dynasty has been pointed out by Renoko Rashidi and several others. It was a black dynasty. And if you don't want to believe what's said, you can just look at their imagery from that dynasty in China. All right. Yeah, early uh, the African presence in early um, Asia. Th those, those general black civilizations are just fantastic. They, they're precious. You got to get them all. On um, the general black civilization, whichever ones it is, all of them, get them. Uh, edited by Ivan Bear Sherman. But I always like to put the emphasis on that. That this is something we gave to the world and so often used against us what we gave as most things we gave to the world. And there would not have been a Bible in existence to others. And it was transplanted 
to other nations, like you asked about China and India. In India, they'll tell you that their civilization was founded there by the Kushites. And that has been, uh, Drusilla Houston deals with that and the wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite Empire and also um, uh, African presence in early Asia, uh, edited by Ivan Van Sertima. Now let me make sure I didn't leave out nothing here. I got so caught up uh, in paper. The, um, huh? Oh yes, of course, we're gonna get to that. Well, music was also a healing art, but that's another question. And it was a, a healing art as well. It was used for healing as well as listening. Now, the probably one of the uh, uh, things that many scholars say is probably the most, among the many aspects of civilization, the most singular, that was the greatest factor in contributing to developing a body of knowledge and keeping that body of knowledge from generation to generation was the science and art of writing, which came first out of Africa. Don't ever forget that. They took all our writings, they took all our stuff from us and then looked at us and said, what did you ever create? We had scripts all over Africa when they couldn't write anything in Europe, nor that they have anything to write on, had any idea that you could write anything. They didn't know what writing meant in the first place. The Greeks and nobody else. It wasn't until Africans transplanted this to the rest of the world. Now in saying that, I'm not putting everybody else down and saying nobody ever did anything. However, it was only natural that the first people on earth would be the first people to create civilization. They didn't just sit here waiting for other people to come before doing it. Uh, the thing that necessitated, uh, uh, or we should say that civilization was born out of what? Necessity. That's what civilization is predicated upon. So you naturally learn because you continue to what? Question. And you continue to question because you need to know in order to survive. So that's what science and knowledge comes out of. We were naturally the first people to do it. So when for white folks say, now nah, y'all doing like we used to do. Y'all doing, y'all have took now and say, ain't nobody ever done nothing but y'all. No, we didn't say that. So we did it first. And that's all. I mean, the, the history just says that. Your, your uh, uh, historian said that. The, the early ones, anyway, said that before y'all decided to reframe the world in the image of white supremacy. Okay, we've dealt with that now that there are a number of independent records, they're a collection of little books, and they were first written on Kwama, which they call papyrus or paper created in Africa. So not only we read the first document, when we read document one, say that the Bible did what originated in Africa, right, which is the proper name is Akebu Land, as, as Dr. Ben tells us, but that's where it began. It be started there because that was the only place that it could have started because it was the only place in the world at the time that what? Writing was going on. Why? Because the material you used for writing, what? Grew there. Very logical, deductible reasoning, isn't it? Very simple, very basic, yet all important. Something as simple as that has been hidden from us for so many years. And we walk around thinking, that we have to equal the white man twice in order to be good. And he has never equaled us once. That's how we can shake off and not walk around. With the frustration there. He has never come up to, oh, let me mention this. Oh, let me mention this. You know what, the, you know what Herodotus, whom we talked about before, whom they call the father, uh, the father of their history? You know what he said? He said that the Greeks say, in his language now, that the Egyptians taught them all they knew and gave them the knowledge of the gods. He also said that the Egyptians said that the Greeks were children, by comparison. So what you're looking at is a man who has never grown up. Let, let, me, let me just, for just a minute, I'm gonna come back to the document, but I'm gonna deal with this. Any, in ancient African societies, and in many today, you don't just automatically become a man or a woman because you reach certain chronological years. You have to go through the process that is called what? Initiation and rites of passage. 
So you have to be prepared for adulthood so you know what the responsibility is, how to respond to those responsibilities, right? That's rites of passage. Now, when they took you off for the secret society training and rites of passage, they took the young men over here, the uh, elder men worked with them, they took the young ladies over here. Not that one was superior to the other, they had different basic functions in the society. And they had to know, know how to do that. Only a woman can teach a girl how to be a woman, only a man can teach a boy how to be a man. Then they bring them back together and they intermingle those and that they relate to each other. That's why we don't relate to each other. We don't know nothing about being men and women. We, we think when our sexual genitals get stimulated, we're men and women. That's not true. We haven't been prepared for adulthood at all. It's thrust upon us, the whole responsibility of it. And that's why most of us crumble under the weight of it. In a, in a proper African society, a man would never run off and leave his family because he was taught from the beginning to take care of his family. But even if he left, the family wouldn't fall apart because the women were self-sufficient because they control the economy in the society. In all African societies, before Islam and everything else came, women control the society. Now, one of the aspects of being able to prove to the elders to pass the test, because if you never passed the test, you were never accepted as an adult. You could be 50 years old, but if you never followed the values that an adult and the way an adult's supposed to act, you were still considered a child in that village. You didn't become an elder simply because you grew some gray hair. You, had, you became an elder because you followed through a certain cycle and certain procedure of life and process of life. One of the main determining factors to let you know that you had now crossed over from childhood to adulthood was your ability to interact and share with others. That was so important. Why? Because when a child is born, what does a child think about? What does a child cry for? In the early years of a child's life, at the breast of its mama, all it knows is me. And then the whole world is there for that child. The mama's breast, I mean, the mama's whole body was there for it. The mama's breast is there for it. The father goes out to hunt to make sure that it's fed. The elders in the community do this. The society is protected by the army. Everyone does all this for what? to make sure that that child grows. So everything is done for the child by somebody else, and therefore in African societies and societies with people of color, the child is the focus and center and the most important aspect in the culture and the society because it is, carries on the life of the people. Now, how do you bridge this gap now when everybody has been lavishing affection on you? Everybody has been taking care of you? Everybody has been feeding you. How do you become self-sufficient to take care of yourself? You have to be taught how to do that. And one of the first things to do that is you have to stop saying me, my, and say us, we. Our, us, and we. Our, us, and we. White people have never learned how to do that. And when you say our, us, and e, you're not in an individualistic society. You're in a what? Collective society because the only thing that will ensure your individual survival and development is the collective, survival of the collective. White people live in a rugged, the law they talk about, they praise the rugged individual. An individualistic society because they came up primarily with each man behind his cave, with his dog guarding his cave. In their early stages of Cro-Magnon, each man had a dog in his cave to keep anybody else from coming to his cave and stealing his food. So now when you start out with that as a premise, as Diop says, it's indelible. So it's in his nature. So he has never grown up because he's still in the me, I. And when you don't do what he wants you to do, he does what a child does when it doesn't get his way. What does a child do? Throw tantrum. Destroy anything, destroy it. You're not my friend anymore. I hate you. And he goes, did he want to beat you up? want to fight you, then we all go through that as children. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we went through it to a degree. I know our parents didn't allow us to do all that. But I'm talking about when dealing with other children out in the street. Stuff didn't go your way, you want to fight. 
That's why you got gang wars, because you couldn't have his way with that. You could have, you fight. That means they have not developed into adulthood. Therefore, when you look at the history of white people and the way they react to other people, if that person doesn't dress the way they want them to dress, if that person doesn't think the way they want them to think, doesn't believe the way they want them to believe, what will they do? Make war on them. A child would do that. So you, when you look at him, you are looking at an unruly child, the bad seed. You saw that movie, The Bad Seed, and that child didn't get something she wanted, she killed people. Does he do that or not? Or am I being hateful? No. He does that. Because we've taken on his nature. You know, and we acting just like that, which means what? We're not growing up. We haven't grown up. We haven't been prepared for adulthood. I just, I just wanted to throw that in there for you, all right? Now, I believe we have answered that question. We answered the question, who wrote the Bible? God, it's time for lunch. Way past time for lunch, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, can we hit two more documents for lunch? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we just answered the question, what is the Bible, right? What is it? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, well, after we finish summing this up a minute, then we'll do some questions and we'll do, all right. All right, but I wanted to make sure we got clear on this. Since we did, we found out who wrote it. What is it? speak Negrito, so which is our papyrus is correct, but we say papyrus, okay, so, okay. but uh, I like the way papyrus yeah, it, yeah, and I like papyrus too, Dr. Best say papyrus, but either way you work it out, it, it comes out the same, all right, so we know that it, first of all, it isn't one book, it's a number of independent records, it isn't holy or more sacred than any other because the word sacred and holy meant what, simply to set apart then to make whole, and that all peoples in the world have their sacred records. So one sacred set of sacred records is no more valuable than another people's sacred set of records. And therefore, I think we deducted from that, and I believe we have a general consensus that no one has the right to impose their sacred record on another people or to defame the, another people's sacred record as being of no value or that they have to accept your particular record. And as this lady brought out, the only reason, the only thing that made it right or wrong for Europeans to take their idea of a sacred record and say that it was superior to everybody else's and impose it on them is what? By power, force of power, by warfare. Not by calling on Jesus, not by praying, not by the Holy Ghost, but by the sword. That's how I did it. Okay, my, 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 you wanted to question. Uh, he, he, I was going to Using the Bible, but he 
food from the goose for dinner. You know, that's what I'm saying. And, and so we get very confused when we stop. Well, and, and when it comes to the order of the, of the books, the order has been switched around so many times. Uh, there, because uh, the, the doing depend upon who was doing the translating and to what purpose they were doing the translating. So the order has been uh, switched around there. Um, again, I want to state that the in, in in terms of the Bible in reference to African people, it is a gateway to us getting back to understanding our history, and it is one of the many books that we produced as a people that contains part of our history. Israelite nation, which was an African nation. But that was only one of the many African nations which existed. Uh, the whole world was not focusing on that. They were focusing on it because it was their history. And it happened to survive many other books because one thing about the Israelites, as they would burn up the books in, in Kemet and they would burn up the books in India and at Kart Hardus and other places, the Israelites would take theirs and bury them off in the desert somewhere. That's why you keep finding these Dead Sea Scrolls and stuff. So that's how theirs was able to survive. Plus, it was the one that the European chose to co-opt because it was the one closest to what he thought he could understand at the time. And that, that's the reason why. But it is not better than the rest, any more than the Quran is better than the rest. They all have value. They're all sacred to us and can give us not only our history, but also spiritual and moral values that we can draw upon. So this yes. is basically hypocritical for the Muslim to, to uh, like almost like to be a point like in the class that uh, the, the Quran was a compilation of certain books in the Old and the New Testament. It's therefore hypocritical for the Muslims to now say the Quran is the only book we should read from when the Quran got their, their idea of God from the Bible. The same way with the Bible itself, when he got it from the book of coming forth by day by night. Yeah, oh, it actually it shows uh, insecurity on the part of human beings to feel the need to say that that which they have developed and created is the only and the best thing that has ever been done. I mean, you discount all of the ages of people who preceded you when you do that and all the ages of people who are to come. And then you also lock the minds of people in a ceiling that it cannot rise beyond a certain level because if your book or what you believe is the total knowledge, then why should I seek to go beyond that? So that means the, the history and the study in Islam that uh, Prophet Muhammad received this revelation by God himself is a fabrication. Let me say this. Every sacred book on earth, if you go down in Yucatan, there and they used to have sacred books down there, the Incas, the Mayas, and all that Aztec. Every one of them will say that they got heard a voice from God and they got an inspiration to write them books. Now, whether it happened, I don't know. I'm just saying, if if you if the Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him, a black man from the Quraysh tribe in Mecca. If he got the inspiration to do the Quran, that's fine. It does not make the Quran better than what my ancestors had an inspiration to write in the Western Sudan and what others had an inspiration to write over here in the Western Hemisphere or in India or in anywhere else. And for him or for his followers or anybody to say that his revelation or anybody's revelation is better than the next person's revelation is not serving God nor man. Yeah. It's only serving somebody's individual or collective ego. That's what it does. But you were Excuse me, let me get his point. Yes. Uh, psychologically speaking, all people do that to bind themselves together so there's common They exclude everyone else because that is the cohesiveness of a group. Whether they be Chinese, African, Caucasian, or anything else, they can't bring into the question or what you might say the fallibility of another person's attitudes. They exclude that. Binding themselves together this way, they will function. But they also become divisive. But them. they can only function beyond a certain point. And it's only great rulers who created great empires in Africa and other places had to transcend. Yeah, those, those individual uh, limitations and bring, and, and the best rulers would always go like Sunni Ali of, of, of the Songhai Empire, founded the Songhai Empire, took the best out of each tribe, 
tribe's tradition and each nation's tradition and incorporated it into the nas national culture. A wise leader will do that. Now, and, now, and it is not so bad for human beings to feel that special, unique connection with the creator of the cosmos. Here's when it really becomes evil, when you seek to proselytize other people to that way of thinking. They convert them to your way of thinking or to destroy them or to discount their right to exist or even question their humanity on the basis that their system of belief or philosophy of life is not in the same accordance with the language of yours. Now note I use the term language because at the basis of all religions are certain principles. And it is only when people get away from those basic principles and get complex in their religions that the religions tend to become corrupt because they've gotten away from the principle now and the religion no longer serves the people but the people serve the religion. That's when it becomes oppressive. That's it. We just, yeah, we were talking about that in the first session here. That religion to African people was a way of life. That's the point. That when it's no longer a way of life and it becomes a religious practice, it's a whole together. Yeah, when it's devoid of spirituality, because spirituality and religion are not one and the same. Religion is an expression of one's spirituality. I mean, one can be spiritual and not have any kind of religion whatsoever. Because spirituality is one's conscious awareness of their connection with the cosmos and the universe around them. Call it God, call it whatever you will. Man, the African understood that so well. That's why the ancient Egyptians, Dr. Bishop said, had no to discipline man back on the proper path. Yeah, whenever you'd have these rise of these prophets, whether it were Jesus, well, whoever the prophet Muhammad was, it was an object, it was in this particular geographical location, what had happened to the people is they had began to degenerate and separate from spiritual principles. So a prophet would rise up to try to bring them back in harmony with those prophets, that particular people. His message was not necessarily for the whole world. Just like Jesus' message was not for the whole world. He said, I come but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He made it very plain. He didn't say nothing about carry this to everybody in the world. He said, carry it to every city in Israel. Carry it all over Israel. He said that very clearly. He said, then will the end come. You can go back and read it. That's what they, oh, oh the way, the way of life. Yeah, as you see me, then you, you, you follow in that. But you see, what the, you see what the European Christians did with that, though. Instead of taking the way as a way of life, they say the way as the only way you can go is to accept Jesus. They took the language and put it in their own interpretation. You see what has happened there, and it's very so simple. We not only live by the, we don't live by the Per se, Jesus, but through Jesus' teaching. Yeah, who was, was the teaching of, of Asa and all the other prophets who preceded him because just like every other great teacher of that day, he studied in Africa. But that's another topic. I'm supposed to get to that later on. Yeah, he... Yeah. His assassination... Yeah, the only thing that his assassination demonstrates, since you brought up the crucifixion, what his assassination demonstrates, his assassination was no greater, and I know y'all not gonna like to hear me say this, and as I say, I'm not attacking the system of belief, but I got to go with what's real. It was no greater than the assassination of King, Malcolm, or anybody else. He paid the price for his liberation struggle. And now we talked about that before. What did they put him on the cross for? For starting a new religion? For the savior of the world, not the Romans. The Romans put in their records, we crucified him because he was a rebel. Yeah. 
He was the king of the Jews. They said he was the king of the Jews, and we're the only ones who have power politically to appoint kings over a subjugated state. So he opposed the Roman Empire, so we killed him. Until somebody came along 300 and some years after the fact and decided that in order to control the minds of the masses of the people, we're going to, and to keep them from rising up politically, we're going to have to keep them docile, and the only way we can keep them docile is to give them this docile image of Jesus. However, the very people who professed to be Christian nations were the most violent and aggressive of all nations. Keep in mind, too that it was only with European Christianity that orthodoxy entered into the world. What do I mean by orthodoxy? Only one way to view a religious expression. Orthodoxy meant the beginning of the control of human beings' minds. Because when your religion does not allow you to think beyond a certain point, it controls your mind and thinking. That's what orthodoxy, uh, European Christianity did that then Islam came in with an orthodoxy religion, or orthodox, where you cannot think beyond the Quran, you cannot think beyond. It was only when the Africans embraced Islam, the Moors out of Africa embraced Islam, that it now was a more tolerant religion that allowed peoples of other ways of religious thinking to function within the confines of its empire. In the Bible, there's a certain part that said, Oh, you cursed these scribes and Pharisees. You had the word and you gave it not. That which you gave is an abomination to God. It said something to that degree. I know the Jerusalem Slim, that's what we used to call Jesus in the seminary, is reported to have said, and see, much of what's in the New Testament was not necessarily stated by Jesus. A lot of that was added during the, the long editorial period. But he most likely would have said something like, cursed you scribes and Pharisees, because he said, you don't have the knowledge, nor will you allow other people. You're the blind leading the blind, and then you stand in the way of other people coming to that knowledge. So it's an awful thing. The point I'm trying to draw here, and I'm gonna close out on this point. It's a very terrible thing to limit other people or to seek to limit their mental and spiritual development. And many people who mean well, when they come up to you with their only way-isms and schisms, that you gotta accept Islam, or you gotta accept Jesus, or you gotta accept this, or you gotta accept that, in order for you to reach a spiritual oneness and harmony with the Creator, they are seeking to limit you to within the confines of their understanding. Now, now that's, that's the sincere ones who don't know. The controllers of the religions, the hierarchy, know what they're doing because their object is to keep the masses of the people under control. That way they do not question what they do because they have the divine right of, of God's authority to do it. Because therefore King James, whom this book was, was uh, trans mistranslated for, King James was therefore had the divine right of kings and the divine authority of the kings. Therefore, which book are you talking about? Angel, African woman. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. You know, so that that's such a profound. Uh, Thing that many of the brothers that I find useful, so I'm not trying to trade you, I, I spend my money. I have 50 people in this class, and I have about 16 brothers that we surround. And uh, the, the, the understanding that we take in the woman out of the African uh, reverential place and the spirituality, which is European idea, and brothers want to keep because you know. Much of the orthodoxy in the black religion is to have women put the women in the first and all that. Yeah, yeah. that's all the women have to pray over their back. The men have to pray over here, the women have to pray in the back of the men. Well, let me speak to that before, and then we'll close this.
this session and we'll go to lunch. Oh, okay. Will you hold that point and make sure I get it when I finish this? First of all, as Haki Mahabudi said so well, only fools limit their women. First of all, only a fool will do that. Right. When you limit your woman, you limit, you, you limit your power source. Therefore, you can't be all the man you're supposed to be because you don't have power source. That's stupid. You don't have power source behind you. Now, white men understood that quite well. Even though they uh, limited the power of black women, they, how are you doing, sister? They controlled it. But they kept that power always what? Near them. In their food, feeding their babies. All that. Why? Because they wanted to be able to control that power. And they called her their what? Their mammy. Their mama. They knew who she was. And they wanted to keep their mama under their control because that's the only way they could control that power. Now, we shouldn't seek to control it. However, we should seek to harness and be connected with it. And for any, first of all, whenever there's a religion or a culture, a philosophy of life that separates the female from the male and puts her on the lower level or in the back, you will note there's a lot of insecurity within the male structure there itself. Either they're not strong in battle, and it's usually in those cultures where the men are very small, diminutive. I find the Japanese and the, I noticed that. The little dudes seem to be the ones that feel the need to, yeah, the Napoleon complex to, to, to distract. Uh, white men like these little skinny women. The little woman is what they like to call it. Black men like, yeah, it's most of it now, you know, we have our children. But why do we like that? Because it's so like how white men want that little one because they can control it. They can control it. They can break it. Sapphire, when you throw that out with her, you got to equal. You do it together. You can let a big one of y'all with me. He can slap that other one. Oh, wow. She cried. Who do you hit me? You slap Sapphire, she's going to put her hand on her head. If she takes time to do that, before she get in your chair. But see, in order for you to be able to deal with that, you have to be a secure male. A secure male does not seek to diminish the female. Thank you. And also, and, and our enlightenment, because we didn't know, we were, we were brought up under this the male-dominated society, born out of the white man's fear. Let, I didn't mean to get into this, but just let me hear it for a second, okay? Yeah. I want to get back to her question. we got to go to lunch, and i got to get back to the subject. Uh, but i, I got to deal with this, though. White males, and see, brothers, I'm, I'm, I'm putting the focus on them because we picked up a lot of their nature. That's right. White male at the center of our religion, first of all, that inspired the Bible and all the other sacred writings, was the female, was the mother God. The, right. the, the, you can find that in our book, African Woman, the Original God. And a lot of brothers are down on me. They say you are um, what you are, a male feminist and all that. But no. Uh, the white male had a basic problem with all humanity uh, outside of himself dealing with genetics, as Dr. Francis Russell points out very well. Yeah. And what it does is this. The power to procreate in the ancient world was considered the greatest power on earth. All religions are predicated upon the power of procreation. I don't care, the Muslims will swear up and down, but they got this fine crescent, which is symbols of procreation. The Christians will swear the cross is a symbol, perverted as it is, of procreation. All of the ancient symbols of religion were symbols of procreation. At the center of procreation, an understanding of the ancient world was the female, because even though we could plant the seed, that's all we could do with it. We can't do nothing else with it, or we did, nature would have let us keep it. We can't. We got to plant it for it to do anything. So she does. She has the chemical lab that makes it become what it becomes. So actually, the God process is carried on within the womb of woman. The creative process. We plant it, and she creates it. And then even for us to plant it, she inspires us to do that because she draws us to her. If we were not drawn to her, we would not plant the seeds. So she 
Duh, and she had a lot of ways of drawing me to it, too. Sometimes all you got to do is walk by. But anyway, to draw, it, that was sacred. That's divine to black people. That's why black people in their natural state don't have a the whole lot of sexual problems. Black white people. And they do not debase human sexuality in their natural state. Yeah, Europeans have sexual problems. Now, here's the thing that really upset the white male. Besides the fact that he uh, was smallest in number of all people and could not produce color left unto himself. The thing that really disturbed him was he did, could not figure out the mystery of how this woman was walking around with a flat stomach one minute, it pokes out and keeps poking out for nine months, and then she did it so he could not figure that out. He did not know. Are you taking over that one or is that? Oh, 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 oh. man. Thank you. You hold my point for me, please. <laughs> I'll always let y'all do the time. Let y'all give me off the stuff. You're going to look at that He did not know that this thing that made him go, oh, oh, had anything at all to do with it. And now, you know, you think I'm going to look at that picture, quest for fire. You remember? Yeah. All they knew how to do was go, oh, oh, and jump in it and jump out. That's all they knew how to do. That's all they wanted to do. He had no idea that this had anything at all to do with this one in her stomach. He did not know this. He did not know it until the African taught him this. It was the Nubian Grimaldis who taught the cro magnon about, well, Crow about 15,000 years ago. cro magnon comes on the scene between 20 and 20. 5,000 years ago, the Nubian Grimaldi had been up in Europe for 50,000, maybe up to 70,000, all over the world, this black man, but that's another subject. They had observed and studied the body of the black woman, and I cover that in this book, so much so that the most sacred thing in life to them was her ability to carry this child and to bring this child forth into the world, so that the first Image of humans carved in stone, carved in terracotta, painted on the rocks of the cave with what? Of the woman, and usually the what? Pregnant woman. Always the big butt woman. All over the world. It was a symbol of divinity. I'm serious. She was God. She was God. Why? Because how did you first, any knowledge of God whatsoever you got in your consciousness? began when your consciousness started to develop. Where did your consciousness start to develop? Where? In the womb. Every thought your mother had was transferred to you. Everything you needed for survival, we just talked about that, didn't we? Came from what? Your mother. You wanted pickles and ice cream, did you get it? <laughs> Everything you wanted, you got it. Your mother supplied that. Therefore, the best way that we can acknowledge and the quickest and most basic way that human beings acknowledge the provision of the creative force in the universe and their connection with the creative force is through what that power of what? Does for them. Mm -hmm. Now you'll see people stand up in church and say, what? I want to testify about what he done for me. I mean, they wouldn't want nothing to do with God if they didn't believe he did something for them. Right. If they believed Jesus could do something for them, Jesus would last five minutes. They just convinced him that he had done something. That's all. But if they were not convinced of that, they wouldn't deal with it no more. And that's what they talk about. What he done for me. So our concept of God is based on what the Creator does for us. And what was our first knowledge of what can be done for us? Woman. Woman. Not only the woman, when you first got in the world, what your daddy just fed you? It was your mama's breast that fed you. So therefore, who would be your first idea of God? Mama. Mama. That's why the African prays today, Mother, Father, God. Because the first idea of God was 
you came to know God or the Creator through your mother. So the first way you came to know the Creator is the way that you what? Acknowledge the Creator. Not that we're bringing the divine force down and putting it on the level of the human. No. The human has to be able to conceive of that. So the way you first conceive of it, and then the second way you conceive of it is your father. Because when your mother's milk was no longer sufficient, it was what your daddy slew out in the field on the hunt and brought back as a provision. The fact that your daddy surrounded and all the other daddies surrounded that village and protected it against all threats and all enemies that you began to see father God. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called mother, father, God. All religion was predicated upon that. Now the European was angry because he did not have the power to do this great miracle, this great mystery of life, and that is to bring forth life. Mm -hmm. He said, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. How is it, can she do it and I can't do it? So what he saw with this child when it came in the world was blood, mm -hmm. the afterbirth. So he says, Obviously, there's a connection between this and breathing. So that's when they came up with the religion of castration. Mm -hmm. Where a man figured if he castrated himself, he might be able to somehow inherit the power to give birth to a child. It sounds stupid to us, but that's the, and it is stupid, but that's what they did. Mm -hmm. They were not advanced enough to, to, to take the attention of They ended up being women. Yeah. Mithraism is based, its priest must be castrated to be priest. Mithraism, one of the ancient religions that came out of Europe, it must be castrated to be a priest. Today, you have them castrating young boys to sing in the choir, to give uh, to God. In India, once it was taken over by the Aryans and the Eurasians, castrating of young men to give, uh, huh? It was Castile. Yeah, cast it where you serve God better if you were cast it. You could get closer to God. And so they went a step from that. I'm going to get your point in a minute. A step from that a minute. That's what I was coming to. The logical. Then they came up with, in order to know God and be a good priest, you can't have anything to do with a woman. Wherein the ancient Catholic priest said, before you can know God, you must copulate with woman. That was the only way to know God was through the inner relationship of male and female. Well, when the, after, when the European comes, he says, in order for me to know woman, to know God, I got to get away from woman. And he went a step further in Christianity and said that woman is the gateway to hell. This is what he said. <laughs> this is that question I got to get to. Right, now I'm coming to you. Yes, yeah, all point. African Genesis. That's why all stories about the creation, no matter what part of the world they come from, talks about this watery state in darkness and the spirit moving upon the face of the deep in the darkness is actually talking about the womb of woman and that the first thing in, pro in creation it says, God said, let there be light. What's the first thing that happens when you part the golden or the sacred gates of the vagina, when you're coming out, you come into the new world of light, is what happens. So that, that's what that's all about. That's all. Now, the European was so angry, the European male, that he could not, the, the African male somehow was satisfied with the fact, look, I can't have no babies, I don't want to have none, so I'll just praise the sister for having them and thank her for inspiring me to come and participate in the process. So he was happy with that. See. The European wanted all the power, the European male, so he said, I can't have the babies. Since I can't have the babies, I've castrated myself and that won't let me have no babies. So what I'm going to do then is control the mechanism that has the child and I'm going to bring my woman up under me. I control her. I control the child she produces. I can buy or sell them. I own them. They are my property. And four men and women from 15 
about around 1500 and 300 years, four million European women were burned at the stake. That's a direct out of their hatred for women. Mm -hmm. The, 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 in the Christian uh, uh, New Testament, the ones that were the, the translated, John Chrysostom, John Marcion, uh, St. Basilides, all of them, St. Jerome, they all were misogynists. They hated women, and that's why you will find in the New Testament that the women keep silent in the church. And they said the women were the gateway to hell. They were temptation. They should keep their hair covered because it tempt men to do evil things. This is the kind of mentality you're dealing with now. And now it's going to come and bring its corrupt idea of the creator, religion, and the Bible to you and say this is that you must follow. But they can no longer control you if you liberate your own mind. When you have knowledge. When you have knowledge. That, that, that is what I was going to say. This is a natural state for us. It is not natural. I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, my goodness. I'm trying to close out on this, but this is... It is not natural for us to debase human sexuality. Human sexuality is a sacred and divine thing which is supposed to energize the people when they come together and take them to higher levels of spiritual involvement and enlightenment. That is what's supposed the natural the, the, between male and female, yeah. black male and female. Let me put it yeah. make that even clear. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about what other people do. I'm talking about between us. One of the best, one of the ways that you really scatter a people's spiritual energy and keep them disconnected from their plug. Now, remember we studied earlier about the fact that Dr. Williams told us in the structure of black civilization that our religion, that is our way of expressing our spirituality, was the dynamic force behind us being able to create these great, marvelous civilizations in the past. So that was it. Now, when you can disconnect the people from their spiritual connection, they cannot achieve greatness. Here's a question we have to ask ourselves and other black people who keep throwing this thing in our face about we got to follow this man's brand of Christianity, this man's brand of Islam, this, that, the other. If, therefore, these things are so good for us, why then, after we sincerely embrace them and black people embrace them more genuinely and sincerely than anybody else does and try to live up to them, why aren't we achieving greatness? Because our religion, our religion was at the basis, I'm coming to you, our religion was at the basis of our achieving great societies then. If this is the correct religion for us now, why aren't we achieving greatness and liberating ourselves? I'm going to come right to you right now. Because one thing that a good religion will do for you, Nat Turner taught you. How it tell me to touch you, it will make you do what? Rise up against your oppressor. Didn't Reverend uh, 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 Henry Highland Garnett tell you that? It'll make you fight your oppressor. It's in the Old Testament. They fought against the Philistines. And, and I'm going to make one more point. They tell us in the churches, uh, thou shalt not kill and this and that. But every, if you look in the Bible, every prophet that God sent to liberate his people killed their people. So there's a power. Yes. This is included. There's a, there's a power okay, okay. and a negative way of murder. Yeah. Murder is when you kill without reason. When you, self-defense is not murder. In defense of yourself and your people is not murder. When you aggressively attack others, then that is murder. Now, when you aggressively attack them to control them, when you attack them to keep them from attacking you, that's self-defense. But I'm trying to finish this, this, this one point. This, we have gotten out of the study. We're getting into the, we're getting into show of African theology here, Jack. So we're getting back to this, this thing, this harmony of the male-female energies. And in African societies and societies of people of color, sexuality was more freely expressed. Now, that's not to say it did not have laws that governed it and all that. It was just more freely expressed. And in most societies of color, it was normally the female who initiated the connection. Not always, but normally. 
and it was up to the female to make the choice as to who she would or would not share her temple with. And if she was not satisfied with her partner, she could leave that partner and go to another. That was in the matrilineal societies, wherein the property and the kingship and the rulership descended through the line of the female, through the line of the mother, which the throne of all ancient African governments was called the throne or the lap of your mother. In Egypt or Kemet, it was called the lap of Osset. He was sitting on his mother's lap because she gave him the power to rule. That's how that, it was the women who conferred the power of rulership through the matrilineal system. Well, now, when the patrilineal system came in under Europeans and Asians, women could no longer make the choice, it was the men who made the choice. It was also the women who devised the method, sisters, of what is called the extended family or sister wife. Why did the women develop that? Because of warfare and because of other factors in many of our societies, there was a depopulation of the male. The belief was no female in a society should be without the connection of a man. Not that she couldn't survive without it or her life was dependent. No, you had to have this sharing of energies in order for there to be a complete balance in everybody's life. So even in some cases, even if there wasn't an intimate or sexual interchange between them, you would still hear of a man referring to this woman as his wife. A man may have 50 wives and may only cohabit with two or three. But these others he was still responsible to because they were a part of his household. And he was their masculine energy just like they were his feminine energy to plug into. The females looked at the male and realized several things. One, that the male draws from her incessantly for his energies, but not only when he's a child, but even as he grows up, his inspiration, everything. The whole society is predicated upon the women. You notice African women work hard to this day. Not that the male didn't. The male took most of the risk. However, that's the hard work, and so she needed help in those societies, and to, to distribute that work, she called upon many times her own sister to come and join that household. Now the other thing is, not just for the work factor, the economic factor, because a household could prosper much better when you got two or three or four people working in that household to bring in income than you have with one or two. Also, you could do a better job with the children because no two people can raise children. They don't have all that you need to do that. You need other, in fact, in the African tradition it says it takes a whole village to what? Raise one child. So you have to have the input of the whole village because in this foolish system, you can't, and folks say, my children get to be a teenager, I don't know what to do with them. That's because you're trying to do something you don't have the ability to do. Two people cannot do it. Even with the grandparents, you need the input of what? The experience of the whole community because there may be something in that child you can't reach that somebody else in that community can reach. Because simply because it's your child, I don't mean you gonna understand anything about it. That child, doesn't happen that way. Now. One of the main reasons why women developed the system of the sister wife, and once again, I want to say this, this was created by women. Now, I can give, give you a Bible story for that. It was created by women, not by males. Because see, what happens is sisters will say, well, y'all brothers like to do this because y'all get the benefit of having all these different women. Now, but that's the way a brother thinks. First of all, he shouldn't have it. He's not spiritually equipped to deal with it because it entails more than the physical aspect, all that, that has its place. She did it because she, if this one man continued to drain all this energy off this woman, he would kill her. So he had to have different for, uh, depositories of that energy to draw from. The greater the man, it seemed like the more the repositories. Why was that? The more he had to do and accomplish in a given society, he needed the more what? energy, which means he had to drain more energy from somewhere. <laughs> and many times from that, so if he did that with one woman, that would be destructive to her. The other thing in that system, I don't even know how I got to this, Lord. The, the other thing in that system 
is the women were generally closer to each other than they were to the man because it was what was called a sister wife. When you hear a brother say, I got four wives, this my wife, that's my wife. Mm -mm. It's got to be, these are my sister wives. See, when they're sister wives, then because they had a bond that that man and that woman can't have it. I mean, they could get in the midnight hour all night long and all day long, too, if they wanted to. They still cannot have the bond that two sisters can have because those sisters would be there with each other when they were producing those children. And they would be sharing that pain with one another through the struggle of birth. That's a bond. And I it's an example of that in Banneker City. There's a brother there, I.J., his wife is a medical doctor, a gynecologist, as a matter of fact. His, the principal wife, one of his wives was having a child who delivered the child but her. Now, what do you think what kind of bond exists between those people? The one reason why the white man, one of the first things he did when he came into our societies was to break that up and then took all of the women that he wanted to himself. See, but to, to preach this thing called monogamy, which is unnatural, in most cases, is not, unless this is just something people want to do. But in most cases, human beings are not that way. And even in societies, you have women with more than one man. Don't get upset, brothers. The Maroons fought up in Jamaica so hard because they had more women than they had men. So, uh, uh, the, uh, what, what, no, they had more men than they had women. I got it right. So the women had to share the men. And so there was a brotherhood with them that would not allow jealousy to enter. Therefore, when they entered into battle together, there was a what? Stronger bond. Jealousy is born out of the sense of ownership. When you seek to own another person. If that person wants to be bound to you and you alone, that is their what? Decision. Therefore, in the marriage vow, to stand up and say, and you to thine alone, to death do you part. You, that's not going to work. Human beings don't function like that. So the societies must determine what is the moral and what is not within that given context. And women have as much right, especially in the Native American societies, they really had that right, as the males to make those choices. Because, whew, I'm trying to wrap this up, you cannot own another person's genitals. A woman's vagina is hers. It is sacred, it is divine, it is the best thing on earth as far as I'm concerned. I, ain't, I don't know nothing better, I don't want nobody nothing better. The best thing on earth that I know of, however, it's hers. Now, if she says to you, this is your stuff, thank her for the honor. Treat it well. But if she decides and says it is not yours, and if she decides to share it with somebody else, you have to decide whether you can handle that or not. But you cannot take her life for it. You cannot defame her for it. You cannot stone her as they did in the Bible for it. You could, because why? Who gave her that body? And who ultimately determines what happens to that body? She does. And then it's between her and, no matter what the different religions say, no matter what, that's what happened. Now, in a given society, what the accepted norm is, if you agree to live with that norm, then you must live by that. If you don't, then you leave that society and you move on. So we cannot, oh, same thing with a woman, want to kill a man because he want to be with another woman? Yes. And the Europeans took advantage of it because they didn't understand it. Oh, wow. See, here's the thing. Can you hold that a minute? Because that's another subject. That's another. Um, let me cap this one up. She had a point I had to deal with. I'm going to deal with that, and we really will go to lunch. Deal with midwives. Because he brought that up, and that had to do with what you're talking about. Yeah, the white man destroyed the midwives in the beginning to get the power of control over birth from the women. Yeah, it was only women who delivered children. It was a problem. Men were not allowed in. It was a thing. It was a sacred uh, uh, mystery thing of the women. Just like men had things they did that women couldn't enter into. That had nothing to do with male chauvinism or female chauvinism. It's just that there were certain things that they did as males over there, and that was sacred to males, and certain things that females did, it was sacred to females. It was as simple as that. That's all. And then they had their times when they came together in society. They had no problem with it. 
It's when you try to say that either the female is, is greater than the male and dominate the male, or the male is greater than the female. We were equal partners. Our history demonstrates that Diop says that the European was totally, his mind was blown when he came to Africa and saw statuary, gargantuan statuary of the female sitting in equal power almost beside the male. And to be, saw all that affection going on between the male and female. And the thing that really took him out was to find out that the male showed so much affection to the female child, wherein in the European society they did not. She was, uh, she was uh, not an asset, she was um, uh, no, not a commodity. She wasn't just a commodity because they did sell her. She was uh, um, on your profit and loss statement. What do you call that? Liability. And after they reached a certain quota, they had to take them and put them out in the woods for wild animals or something to get. Even in the days of Rome, they left them on the, on the steps of the temple of, of, of Juno because you couldn't have but so many females within a given European society. You also mentioned when you were talking about where um, the Bible came from, you mentioned. Uh, Coming forth by day and by night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, book of the coming forth by day and by night is the book from which we get most all of the sacred writings because it was the first to be written that was sought to uh, systematize some type of ritual or system of belief. The uh, Egyptologists, quote unquote, European persuasion, call it the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So that's, that's the coming book by, by night, by night coming book, right. What they call the Egyptian book of the dead. And even though it has to say a lot about the dead, we must understand this, to the African, even then, there was no concept of death. There are several rites of passage you pass through, and this was called the last rite of passage. It was not called death. But in preparing to make that rite of passage, just as you had to have the preparation for the rite of passage, to go from childhood to adulthood, you had a rite of passage, prepared you for it, you had to have a preparation for what? The last rite of passage, which was you passed on to the ancestors or into the netherworld, because they believed this. And it seems to be very much rooted in their uh, scientific understanding, because they were the first scientists, and they understood the science of life and the natural phenomena very well. Atoms and molecules do not die. They do not. You cannot destroy energy. Energy just takes on different forms and substances. What we are are human batteries, and we carry around within us energy, which they call spirit, force, atoms and molecules all through us. When this body dissipates, what happens to those atoms and molecules? They exist in the universe. We call that our ancestors. That's what we call it. Also, they exist in our children and grandchildren, because you can look in the face of, 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 of some of your children and see your great-grandmother. Act just like her, talk like her, everything. Right. That is a part of your great-grandmother or your great-grandfather. They, they don't change. They can. Only white men trying to change it. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and that's how come we're coming up with all these diseases, because you keep messing with something you haven't been messing with. Well, African was quite content with it, left it alone. He understood it, though. He understood it. Now, uh, getting back to that, so that's this thing of, of the book of the coming forth by day and by night. The gods and goddesses in there were merely scientific symbols. They were symbols of a high culture science, and I, I, I go into that here in the book African Genesis. I really get into it there. Just like you go to a computer, when you press a certain symbol on that computer, it can call up to you what? Information. Is the symbol you press the information? No. What is it? It's, it's a sign. It's a sign that you use what? To access. To what? Access. The gods and goddesses were scientific symbols to access scientific information. It was a part of their ancient computer system. Is what it was. And the end that they saw the creative force in everything, in every leaf, every blade of grass, every grain of sand, everything, every ripple and drop of water. Therefore, whatever happened, the creator had something to do with it. So they therefore named it a deity.
because the creator was being manifested in it. To the African, as I read from Dr. Williams, there was only one universal, divine, creative force in the universe, one divine intelligence. Everything else, gods and goddesses, was a manifestation of the multiple aspects of the one. So sacred was this to the African that he'd never built a temple to the one. Never built a house to house the one. Only Europeans and Asians believe that they can build a house and put God in it. They're the only people who think they can do that. The African knows you cannot take the sum total of the universe and put it in a house. Nor can you put it between the covers of a book. So that's why he had this reverence for all people's belief. They thought, oh, he's so easy and childlike. We can convert him to Islam. We convert him to Christianity. See, he saw no difference in it than what he already believed. It was just another way to say it. You know. Okay, did I get all your points? Because he had a question, and I'm really going to try to close this, this section down. Just like your body, your body. It's just at the point, you know, this thing with women always in the papers and stuff. Oh, I didn't even finish that. On the, on the, on the, the thing of abortion, right. In, uh, okay, it is her right to decide, first of all. However, if you were in a society that was of the creation of this woman and her people, a society that provided all the needs for everyone in that society, the woman would not feel the need for abortion. Only in the case of it threatened her life. We live in a society now, and I'm not saying pro or con, I just want you to listen to me. Well, on the one hand, they tell her she doesn't have the right to make the decision. On the other hand, they tell her they're not going to supply the means to help her take care of it. The very ones that tell her she doesn't have the right to make the decision also tell her we're not going to give you the means to do it. You know why? Because we want you to keep having them so we can have more to exploit. Now, for us, here's my thing. I would rather see us have them because we have more warriors for the future. We have more people to build our nation. However, if we are not willing to create a collective communal society to take care of those children, then we have nothing to say about the decision that that woman makes. If we have a collective society that takes care of those children, what do I mean by a collective society? A woman should not be made to take care of a child by herself. Not even a man and a woman should be made to take care of a child by themselves. So if she has to do that, if you have a collective society in your structure, just like in the Polynesian island, you, you will find many brothers and sisters from the bush, not from the cities. They come from the continent, from the bush. When they make money here, what do they usually do with it when they get their paycheck? Why? And when, when they say take care of the family, they're not just talking about their brothers and sisters and all that. They're talking about the whole village. Because what? The whole village took care of them. So we're living in a society now where economics makes it so difficult to meet the needs of children when you've got one or two people to do it. However, if we add collective institutions primarily dedicated to the care of children, then the women can have the children, the children are well taken care of, and they do not have to worry that they will be left on their own. I will not pass a moral judgment on it. I do not like the idea of the concept of abortion. However, until I, as a black man, in concert with other black men, build a society for her that she can feel safe in having her children, I cannot say nothing about it because I haven't done my part. <laughs> What's that, my sister? I just want to say, it's um, the thing to me that the creator makes the decision as a person who wants to have a child, and if you um, destroy a child, you can destroy a part of yourself, and your own spirituality is the same to me. But what that does come back to, sister, is it's a decision between the woman and her creator. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I can pass a moral judgment on, or that any of us can pass a judgment on. When we sit down and talk with that sister, 
when we sit down and talk with that sister about that baby, I'm going to sit down and talk with her about, because I've had people come to me with this problem. I don't sit down and talk with her about, you should do it because it's morally right for you to do it. You should not kill the child. Even though I believe that, I will state this is my belief. I don't think you should kill the child. I don't think you should destroy the child. However, I'm not going to condemn you for your decision because the main thing I need to be talking with her about is how am I going to help you take care of this child. That's the point. And if I can't talk to her about that, I ain't got nothing to say. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not talking about the relationship between her and God and the spiritual and moral side of it. That is personal. That is a personal thing. And I won't get in it. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not evading it, but I'm not going to take a public stand one way or the other. I don't personally, I take a stand. I don't like to see the killing of black children. I think that person's that. However, the other side of that coin is we must develop a society where the sister can feel comfortable and safe and happy. Absolutely, because there's a thing that needs to be a double minded question. Absolutely, the thing that they need to control um, your, just controlling that new process. It's her decision in the final analysis. Okay. And I think that if, you, if you're related to the sister and you are working together as brother and sister and you're willing to help her provide, then it's not just her decision. Although finally it's hers, it's a decision that you must be involved in too because you are all working together and you did procreate together. So that I think in all fairness, still she's the one that's going to have to carry it and, 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 and all that. So that finally, you, you have to respect it. You can't say this. Well, I'm the man and this is my baby. It's not yours. You have a part of it. It is not yours alone. You may get mad with her. You might cut her loose for it. You might do all of that. But actually, the final decision rests with her as to what she's going to do with her body. So you make sure when you hook up with a sister, if you that, feel strong about that, that she's of a state of mind that she won't do that. that, that that's what you do. But um, that's as far as I'm going with it. But I still put the emphasis on the and ultimately, the responsibility is on us as a people to provide mechanisms for communal care of our children. Oh, your point, just one minute, brother. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to you. Uh, what do I mean by communal? See, a lot of things that we can do, it's not difficult to take a whole lot of money. The reason why we were able to survive so often in the South and when we first got up here, before we became urbanized, is because of our policy of sharing and collectivity with one another. We could take a lot less and go a lot further on it because we had that spirit of sharing. Now we're into I, me-ism and individualism, and I'm trying to take care of my needs, so I can't help you take care of your needs. When if we have a collective, when I say collective, Lord have mercy, let me define that. Because a lot of times, brothers and sisters will come along and say, we're doing a collective thing. And when you collect the money up, it turns out to be their thing. <laughs> and ain't nobody got nothing to say about it but them. <laughs> we're having that problem in Banneker City now. Money was collected for the elders, uh, for, for the uh, scholars to go like Dr. Williams and others. Now, the brother think it's his money. You know, No, no, you, it's got to be really collective. Really collective. When it's collective, that means you don't have one person making the decision. You have a what? A council, a group of people making the decision there. And you have to have an appointed council because if you try to get everybody to make a decision, you won't make none. That's right. Because everybody's going to have a different opinion. You're going to argue all night. <laughs> so you have to appoint, as we always did, a council of elders and mothers that you trust to make that decision. Yeah. Now, if they can't make it, they bring it to the people for a vote. You do it right. Some Africans practiced that, as Dr. Williams said, for 16 years in studying on the continent. Everywhere he went, he saw the African constitutional system permeating everything, which is it was a collective decision-making process. And you always looked out for the two basic people in your community, and that is your what? Your youth and your elders. You do not go without that. So what is called a daycare center can be transformed with just a few more steps into an African village. In that center, you have, when they walk into that center, they are no longer in America. The whole decor in that center, everything in that center is African centered. So that child is, their whole mind is permeated with that. That's all they, now I know they tried to do that with the independent schools, but what happened with the independent schools so often 
is many people couldn't pay the tuition. And once again, each person trying to pay their own tuition. So they couldn't keep the teachers they need to keep them in the school. And then what happens oftentimes with the independent schools is the headmaster of the school says, it's my school. You know, and so then people start breaking off and leaving because what they thought was a collective is no longer a collective anymore. It's a unilateral decisions are being made. But I'm talking about just taking the, the, uh, the, the centers that you already have that serve you in your communities and just taking them a step further into African villages. And collectively, whether you have, see, we only input in these if we have children. If you don't have children, you should really put some money into it. Because you ain't got no children to feed, you can help to feed some others. You, you see what I'm saying? So that takes some of the weight off these brothers and sisters that's trying to feed theirs every day. Everybody in an African village has a child, or two, or three. Everybody in the village has some children. Everybody. One of the things I admire about Dr. Ben is most of his children are what? Adopted. But there's no such thing as adoption. They're all our children. We say that. We say that, yet they're brothers and sisters struggling under the weight of trying to take care of their children, and you can go spend all of your paycheck on you. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy some of your paycheck, because I don't want to say that we shouldn't enjoy our life. However, you should come up with this. Now, here's the other thing about that. When the children are dependent totally on their parents for input all day, every day, the children break down under the strain, the parents break down under the strain. Now don't they? So then you end up letting them sit in front of the TV or something else. Yeah, you let them sit. However, if you have a collective situation that they can go to, that they're in for a large portion of the day, they know who their mother and father is. They got time with their mother and father, but they're in a collective environment where they do a lot of the things they like to do with their peers because children really prefer being with children. They really do. Then, right, so you have your... Right, so you have that becomes their brother. Every mama and baba becomes their mama. Now they come home with their genetic parents and they sit out each evening, they have the meal, and you do things together. But if the majority of their day is in that communal setting, that frees up the parents not to party, not to run the streets, but to do what? To carry on their working activity, to carry on their economic development, their or their education, whatever they have to do to be better providers, for that family, because you have brothers and sisters who are committed to and specialize in taking care of those children in that village, keep that village in communal environment, and they are able to take care of their families. Why? Because you take part of what you earn and to make sure that they take care of them. If you stop seeing it as a, a business in terms of a daycare center and take it a couple of steps further, you can transform it into that. And that way you can be sure you got African conscious people in there so you know who you're leaving your children with during the day and all those kind of things. And it's not governed by, and it's not owned by the people in there taking care of those children. It's governed and owned by the what? The community that it served. That's African, man.